Thank you, Marcia. A very kind introduction. And uh, I want to thank you uh, for inviting me to come. And I was, it's really a great honor to be here and to be able to speak to um, this uh, sort of really high quality audience. Um, and also many thanks to uh, Bonnie Rose Shulman as well for the invitation. So uh, I'm, I'm, as I said, very pleased and honored to be, to be here. Um, I am a historian, as, as you know, so um, hold on to your hats. This is really a lecture about history, uh, just by a little bit by way of uh, a warning. Um, but I would say what you know, better setting could there be, perhaps, for an exploration of gendered violence um, than the 17th and 18th century world of Mediterranean piracy, a world of swashbuckling corsairs of all stripes whose violent practice of their masculinity at sea rendered the waters a place of danger, threatening above all the virtue, if not the lives, of helpless females who could be captured, enslaved, and then subjected to unspeakable degradation. And we have a wealth of narratives that have capitalized over the course of the centuries on this particular version of gendered violence from the earliest uh, uh, of the captivity accounts in the 16th century, uh, right up to uh, Victorian pornography, which uh, featured uh, you know, volumes like The Lustful Turk, Plotline, Piracy, and you can imagine the rest, um, right up to contemporary potboilers that take white slavery in Arab harems as their plot line. And, uh, so here's a, a recent publication. This is The Fourth Queen by Debbie Taylor. It is about um, actually a English or Scottish woman who married the Sultan of Morocco, a, uh, a Sultan of Morocco, um, and more about this, more about this later. Um, I don't think it's a great literary masterpiece, but it has a good cover. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and perhaps this storyline touches a chord. A gendered violence in its most straightforward form posits the male as the aggressor who subjects his female victim to violence as a means to assert his domination and enforce her submission, inscribing on her body the gendered relations of power that inform and reinforce a patriarchal system. And the mere threat or, or potential of this, for this violence is often sufficient in and of itself. Men cultivate a form of masculinity that suggests through dress, through accessories, mannerisms, that they are active, they are strong, they are powerful. Witness, for example, the exaggerated and outlandish appearance of many pirates, how they dress, how they display their battle wounds, peg legs, eye patches, etc. Um, even if sometimes we have a foppish version of the same. <laughs> so the vulnerability to violence is likewise enacted by women uh, who seek male protection from male violence through forms of femininity that may actually shrink their physical presence, be overly thin, unmuscular, alternately reveal or conceal their bodies, wearing articles of clothing that impede their movement. Um, so gendered violence takes its place in the context, uh, when we usually talk about gendered violence, it takes its place in this context of gendered power relations as a critical tool used to underscore and maintain male dominance. But there are complications, and I want to address three of them in the course of this talk. Um, First, most violence, presently and historically, is perpetrated by men against other men. Uh, most victims of Mediterranean piracy were, in fact, male. Uh, it is other men, not women, who are most likely to experience male violence. So was violence doing some other work here in the context of male social relationships? That was the first question. Second. Women are not necessarily passive victims. We all know this. We've all heard this so far this morning. Um, and um, there are women who are perpetrators of violence. 
There are women who use their femininity to confront, to deflect, or perhaps to repair male violence. And what were these techniques in the case I'm talking about, and how did they work? And third, gendered violence can intersect with other categories of difference. When violence is directed against someone of another nation, race, or religion, as well as sex, is gender simply another aspect of this violence, or does it serve to establish some kind of overarching framework? In other words, what was the connection between pirate violence and the newly emerging order of European empire in the Mediterranean with all its religious and increasingly racial overtones. So in looking at these questions in the context of Mediterranean piracy, I want to emphasize change over time as a good historian. Um, I'm not dealing with gendered violence as a trans-historical, biologically determined aspect of the human condition, but rather as a social practice responsive to transformation on many levels. Um, the aggressive expansion of trade activities, for example, or the rise of the regulatory nation state, or the emergence of do, new forms of domesticity, they all shape the prevalence and the forms of violence um, in the historical moment. The history of Mediterranean piracy allows us to address questions about the meaning and complications of gendered violence in a dynamic period of transition, a period when new actors and new forms of economic, political, and social interaction were crowding into the Mediterranean world. So the Mediterranean, just a bit of background. Um, there's a history from ancient times of piracy in the Mediterranean. Uh, locals operating from their own shores, intruders entering the sea, uh, attacking or raiding coastal communities as well as ships. Pirates came in roughly two varieties. We can use the term to refer to what we might call pirates proper. That is, people who are operating on their own account, who might be professional rovers, or perhaps even fishermen from coastal communities who have fallen on hard times and take to attacking ships in their vicinity. Um, but we have another category of pirate, and I'm going to use the term for both these categories, by the way. We have another category of pirate, um, those that we designate uh, pirates, but who are officially sponsored privateers or corsairs, Typi very typical of the early modern period I'm talking about. Uh, these are uh, seafarers who hold commissions and licenses in the forms of letters of mark or reprisal, um, and either fr from, their, from a sovereign state, or sometimes they might enjoy the direct patronage of their rulers. And we should understand that in the early modern period, these are not terribly distinct categories. The distinction between the private pirate and the corsair, primarily because one and the same individual could slide back and forth between these two uh, particular roles. Now, for the Mediterranean, I would just note in passing that geography played a role in the encouragement of piracy of both kinds. Um, much of the Med Mediterranean coast, as I'm sure you're aware, is very jagged, many small bays, coves suitable for secure and private anchorage for, for pirate ships and for their prizes. It, there, it is often there are a lot of mountains and hills also around the coast, which um, uh, afforded caves for the stashing of captured goods and ravines that allowed for quick retreats to the interior when necessary. So pirates could be pretty hard to find and even harder to capture. Uh, in addition, it's been noted that certain patterns of winds and currents, for example, those near the Straits of Gibraltar, uh, abetted pirates by becoming ships and making it difficult for them to flee attacks. And the technology behind this is that a lot of pirate activity was carried out by galleys. Um, some of the, Will talked about some of those slaves um, in military galleys, but some of those no doubt were sometimes put to piratical activities as well, and galleys because their road are much more maneuverable and much faster than a, uh, than a ship unless it's under uh, full sail. So, um, so while we've had piracy in this region 
since time immemorial. It was really in the late 16th and 17th, early 17th centuries that there was a distinct upsurge in pirate activity in the Mediterranean. And an upsurge in the sense of the incidents of attacks on ships or coastal communities and the violent seizure, seizure of the ships, of the cargoes, of the people um, increased. Um, and it, this increase is directly linked to the rise of merchant empires and to the corresponding overall growth in sea trade on the one hand and conflict over trade routes on the other. Piracy and particularly corsairing grew in the Mediterranean as a result of political and economic choices on the part of emerging Dutch, French, and English merchant empires. Uh, whether they opted for the imposition of monopoly or for free access, expansion of these empires entailed the use of force at sea, against, particularly against those whose roots they wished to capture or who resisted their presence. Um, it's been pointed out that war and commerce went together for 16th century Europe, and northern European merchant ships routinely used violence against Spanish, Venetian, or Ottoman ships um, that they encountered, that contested their ambitions, appeared to stand in the way of desired access um, to certain ports, or simply proved irresistible targets. Fernand Brodel had, has uh, earlier taken a very similar position in viewing the aggressive appearance of northern European pirates in the Mediterranean as a sign of bids by the English, French, and Dutch merchant empires to establish themselves by using a variety of tactics, including piratical activity. So piracy persists as a handy weapon for securing trade advantage up to the time when these new merchant empires, the Northern European merchant empires, developed effective national navies, powerful enough to protect their merchants. And at that point, which I will get to a little bit later, in the late 18th, early 19th centuries, European empires came to forbid and criminalize pirate activity, including corsairing, and the official fleets were given a monopoly over the use of violence at sea. So piracy in the Mediterranean is also linked to, and I quote here, um, Pal Fodor, linked to, and I quote, the attempt of impoverished societies excluded from the mainstream of development to compensate themselves, at least in part, for the losses caused by the, by the commercial ascendancy of the northerners. So these so-called impoverished societies came to include Italian city-states, such as Venice and Genoa. These are the people who are beginning to to join the losing side in the Mediterranean, um, Venice and Genoa, Spain, and certainly parts of the Ottoman Empire, particularly its North African provinces, and also Morocco. In the case of North Africa, the Ottoman provinces, later termed regencies of Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli, putatively under the suzerainty of the Ottomans, gradually came to rely heavily on the proceeds from corsairing which constituted a significant proportion of state revenues from the late 16th well into the 18th century in the form of booty, of captives, as well as financial payments being made by European powers in return for protection uh, for their ships from pir pirate attacks. So it, there was a bit of a protection racket in place as well. Um. Although the targets and tactics might shift, depending on the state of war and peace, as well as changes in trade patterns, piracy in the form of corsairing did indeed emerge as a central survival strategy for the North African states whose, legitim whose legitimate trade had suffered uh, from European competition. So just to, to summarize here, at the pinnacle of pirate activity in the 17th century, we find a number of groups and loci um, of pirates in the Mediterranean. They have somewhat different modes of operation, but I won't get into the details here. But the most important of these groups, for our purposes today at least, uh, were three. The first was Christian military orders uh, operating from the Italian ports of Pisa and Livorno and from the island of Malta. Yeah. Doesn't, I think maybe the next map it shows up better. Yeah, modern map, but you can see the island of Malta there, as well as uh, the other 
most of the major pirate ports at least make it on this map. So there are the Christian military orders, Pisa Livorno, and above all, from the island of Malta. There are the state-sponsored corsairs operating out of the North African ports of, of Algiers, Tunis, Tripoli, and the Moroccan port of Saleh, around in the Atlantic. And then we also have the newcomers in the sea, the Dutch, English, and French. Of course, the French are not entirely new to the Mediterranean, but they do see great, greatly expanded maritime activity in this period. The Dutch, English, and French all supplement their commercial activities with piracy, and they practice it in an aggressive and armed form of mercantilism. So this is not by, these, by any means an exhaustive list. These are the main actors, but ships flying a variety of flags, including Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, Russian, Swedish, uh, were all engaged in, in Mediterranean piracy at some point in the early modern period. So piracy was very much a fact of life in the Mediterranean. It was a widely accepted mode of warfare and profit making. It was often state sponsored, and it was generally viewed as business as usual. And we tend to think of piracy as something disruptive, as injurious to the smooth functioning of political, economic, social life. And it's certainly true that piracy had some very great costs in terms of human lives, material goods, the many anxieties it provoked. I mean, you don't have to go very far to, in your reading to find that, to, to realize that people up from the early modern period who lived around the shores of the Mediterranean were, had a very high level of anxiety about what uh, might happen uh, if they got on a boat and uh, as a result of pirate activity. Um, but piracy, I, I think we have to remember that piracy was also an activity that forged political, economic, and cultural ties at a time when they were in rather short supply and served as a con an important connector between rising European empires, the Ottoman Empire, the North African provinces, and was really central to the, sh the making of a distinctly Mediterranean space. And, and that's because the whole business of piracy, including the marketing of purloined goods, there were a lot of black markets around in these various ports, the refitting of the ships, the ransoming of the captives, all these things wove webs of connection around the shores of the Mediterranean. But of course, at the same time, piracy was by definition a violent enterprise, and our investigation of gendered violence therefore finds much to engage here. So, enough background. I'm going to get, I'm going to, get to the violence here. <laughs> so, uh, let's begin by asking our first question about the meaning of gendered violence in the context of piracy. As the ships were boarded, and crews and passengers were overpowered, captured, and subsequ subsequently enslaved, what kind of dominance was being asserted in the process? It was cer certainly, in large part, male dominance over other men. The 16th century of a 16th century account, well, we have a lot of accounts, fortunately, but there's one 16th century account of a merchant ship's boarding by Ottoman corsairs, uh, and it, this account is by an Englishman by the name of John Fox. Um, it might have looked, you know, something like this. I mean, you can you can see the setup here. The, the, you know, on the right you have the, the pirate ship, and on the left you have, um, a very well armed, by the way, merchant ship, which they were. I mean, they were not just peaceful sailing vessels. These merchant ships, they they usually had lots of, lots of guns. So as the ships, so John Fox in his 16th century account gives us a very stirring tale of the actual pirate attack. It is a stirring tale of masculinity and militarism. So uh, he tells us that the, the, these, what he calls the Turks, the Ottoman Corsairs, um, start uh, attacking the ship and the English captain raises his sword in defiance of these Turks, and then uh, Fox says, and I quote, so likewise stood up the owner, the master's mate, boatswain, purser, and every man well appointed, now likewise sounded up the drums, trumpets, and flutes, which would have encouraged any man had he never so little heart or courage in him. I'm not sure where all these drums, trumpets, and flutes came from, <laughs> but... Um, but in his telling, the English crew then fights valiantly, some dying in action, 
but they are eventually overpowered by the Ottomans who manage to wrest their weapons from them and the survivors are captured, taken to Alexandria and made galley slaves. Fox's account of his uh, experience then grows a little sparse until we get to the story of the great and violent escape that he and others make uh, from Alexandria after what he terms a hot skirmish with their captors. So the resistance to the boarding and the later escape have their male heroes. John Fox is among them, um, and they use their courage and strength to triumph over their male enemies. So the pirate encounter is narrated with plenty of violence on both sides. The merchant ship is well armed, ready to resist. The corsairs are practiced in their attacks, and both will fight like men until they lose the means to do so. Um, once a ship was captured, the crew and passengers could be the most valuable prizes taken by the corsairs. Uh, available evidence does not allow us to estimate precisely how many people were captured by pirates operating in the Mediterranean, but the numbers were significant. Just a few benchmarks in the year 1611, an Arab traveler was told that the number of Muslim captives resident in Malta at that one point in time reached uh, almost 6,000. In the later 17th century, we, we uh, estimate that about 200 new captives arrived in Malta each year, but this figure doesn't take into account all of those who were captured by Maltese pirates and then ransomed before they actually reached the island. Um, and on the other shore, Corsairs operating out of the port of Tripoli, for example, which was one of the smaller of the North African corsairing ports, had a modest number of ships, um, were still capturing, um, still had maybe 12 to 13 uh, ships operating. And they captured anywhere from up to 300 um, corsairs in the 17th century, 300 a year. Um, and of course, a port like Algiers had many more uh, Corsairing ships, uh, probably, uh, you know, roughly 50 or so uh, in the 17th century. Um, and there were English captives, there were, uh, um, you know, but, but there were other captives, probably we know the, the most has been written about English captives, I would put it that way, but there were many other kinds of captives as well. Um, French, Neapolitan, Dutch, German, Scandinavian, Portuguese, and probably above all in terms of numbers, Spanish uh, in, in as far as North Africa was concerned. And finally, when in the spring of 1816, kind of the towards the end of our story here, almost all captured slaves being held in the North African Regencies were freed, were well past the high watermark of captivity, but still there were some 1,600 uh, of these slaves in Algiers, almost 1,000 in Tunis, and 600 in, still in Tripoli. So as a valuable commodity, these captives were not, as a general rule, killed or treated in a way that threatened their survival. Um, that was really not the point. They were widely perceived to be a valuable resource. Many of them, the, many of the men were skilled craftsmen, actually, with nautical experience, so they would have been considered very useful people. Um, they also derived their worth from the probability of their eventual redemption. And ransoming was big business. Well-placed and connected individuals were usually ransomed speedily for high sums. Um, and here is a ransoming scene. Um, these are Spanish friars, actually. They were orders of Spanish friars who specialized in, I mean, that was their mission, was the redemption of captives. And they would make periodic, they would make, you know, periodic trips to North Africa to uh, ransom, uh, ransom groups of captives. This would be for the poorer captives, not for the well-placed who had their individual ways of raising raising money. Um, but before they were ransomed, they were enslaved, and violence or the threat of violence was often part of the experience of captivity. A group of Englishmen held captive in Tunis and Algiers in the mid-17th century petitioned the English crown to help in raising the 50 pounds per head demanded for their ransom. They sought a letters patent from the king so that the money could then be collected through various charities um, in England. 
And their petition is instructive um, in its appeal to the transgressions of their masculinity. The 62 poor captives reported that they and others are in a slavish condition. And I quote, not only subject to torture and most unnatural and abhorred abuse of our bodies, but by terror of future torments threatened. If our ransom come not within a short time, doth seek to reduce us to the bitter perdition of our souls. So it's not only standard violence that they endure, according to this petition, but the most unnatural and abhorred abuse that conjures up the image of male rape. Whether we have an instance of accurate reporting here or not, and there's no corroborating evidence to suggest we do, um, we can still conclude that they thought an allusion to this form of male violence, a violence that dishonors men by treating them as women, would be effective in securing their release. Muslim captives as well reported being physically abused. Uh, Ahmed bin Mohammed bin al-Qadi, the well-connected scribe of the ruler of Morocco, was captured by Maltese in 1586 on a trip to Egypt. And he wrote in his memoir of hunger, cold, beatings, and tortures. But as Nabil Matar notes, his account is exceptional in even the brief space it devotes to the description of physical violence. Most of the Muslim captivity narratives gloss over violence and physical abuse, a subject apparently not deemed appropriate for public discussion. So piracy entailed male threats and practices of violence against other men, violence that coded masculine traits of courage, strength, and force. The centrality of Violence to the assertion of masculinity has been noted in other relevant contexts uh, at, at the time. Robert Shoemaker, for example, found in his study of the high number of homicides in 17th century London that the mostly male violence was often uh, prompted by perceived threats to male honor and the male need to demonstrate courage, strength, and independence by their willingness to fight. Uh, and I quote Shoemaker, for men, violence was a public method of confirming their gender identity and affirming their honor. The subjection to violence was, by the same token, an emasculating experience, but the ability to inflict violence, or at least resist it, was the mark of a man. And so manhood was being continually tested here, the drama of boarding the ship, the endurance of physical abuse, the dramatic escapes, all these, these things were trials of masculinity. And it was a masculinity that was increasingly tied to forms of identity as men represented certain faiths or nations, a point I will return to. But if pirate violence was mostly an affair of men against men, women were not left out of the picture entirely, as you might imagine. So we can now ask our second question. How did women participate in this violence? as abettors, as victims, as buffers. Uh, now, women could be found aboard ships, of course, and in coastal communities. And in both places, they would be subjected to pirate raids and capture. They were captured for ransom, much as men were. But they did have other possible destinations, including slavery in households and concubinage. And Will talked about that this morning, too, the, the sort of destinations for female slaves. Um, and certainly women feared piracy at sea and were not spared the violence of capture and enslavement. Okay. This is a, the, Eliza Bradley, an English woman who wrote a very famous account of uh, her captivity, and this is, uh, well, a very interesting picture of her <laughs> being transported into captivity after she's been captured at sea. Um, the notion that most captured women were passive victims who ended up in sexual servitude, however, is belied by the accounts of female captives themselves. One of the most intriguing of these is the story of a Dutch woman, Maria Termitelen, whose narrative of capture in the early 18th century came to my attention through the work of Khaled Bekawi. From the beginning, Maria did not appear to fit the victim mode. Mold, I'm sorry, the victim Mold. She was a cross-dresser in her teens who posed as a male to enlist in a military regiment in Spain. 
She subsequently married a Dutch sea captain, and she sailed with him, as captains' wives often did in those days. When their ship was attacked, attacked by corsairs from Morocco, she bravely stood by her husband as most of the crew fled. She then behaves with courage and cunning as a captive of the Moroccan Sultan. She nurses her ailing husband until he dies, fends off enormous pressure from the ladies of the Sultan's court to convert to Islam, eludes the Sultan's advances by feigning to be pregnant, and then she chooses her next husband, she kind of picks him out, the head of the Dutch community, the local Dutch community, and even prevails upon the Sultan to arrange her marriage. So she narrates one of the, her dramatic encounters with the Sultan, whose wish it was that she convert and stay with him. So, and she, and I quote here, I hurried after him to the gate through which the king was going to leave and prostrated, my, prostrated myself again and said, Cut off my neck. I prefer this to becoming a Turk. The king, seeing my determination and courage to be such as of a lion, and that I was hindering him from leaving his palace, cast terrible looks at me. But in the end, as we know, the sultan acceded to all Maria's wishes. She then spends 12 years in Morocco, surviving with her growing family through several changes of reign, through famines, through plagues, and she also grows in stature among the captive community and takes on the role of intercessor between the authorities and her community until she is ransomed along with others um, by a Dutch organization. So Maria is the hero of her own story, of course, and so we might expect to find a little bit of embroidery here. But the fact that she presents herself as she does, intrepid, smart, worldly, stalwart, says much about her will to refuse the role of the victim. Um, she's also ready to confront violence when necessary or to deflect it, if possible, by the use of various performances. You know, here's my neck, cut it off, um, and also subterfuges. Oh dear, I'm pregnant, therefore unfit for the harem, which was completely uh, uh, a total lie, actually. You know. So the, the spirit of defiance is mirrored in another account, this one by a Moroccan woman related to Moulay Suleiman, the Sultan of Morocco, who was captured with her husband by Maltese pirates in the eight, late 18th century. Um, Sayyid Lala Fatna bin Sidi Mohammed bin Abdurrahman wrote to the Sultan, to whom she is related, to report her own, their, their capture and their conditions, and no doubt to seek his help with a ransom payment. I'm sure the situation is here. The, Pirates were very well aware when they had a valuable captive in, in their hands, and so they would press, they, you know, they, they would uh, single this person out and make special requests for very high ransoms for them. So that's uh, no doubt her situation. And she, in, in this letter she writes to the Sultan, she gives graphic testimony of her plight. Uh, and, uh, and I quote, I don't know if I have a, yes. Um, may God prolong your life and increase your days. All what has befallen me, I shall relate to you in this missive. Today, the Rumi who owns me sits on a chair, puts the inkwell in my lap and smokes in my lap and the smoke rises up my lap and against my face. I said to him, enemy of God, why do you smoke in my lap? And he said, you are mine. I do with you whatever pleases me. So, I think also an interesting part of this is the, you know, he's, he's such a, I mean, imagine using the inkwell as an ashtray, right? That's an additional nice touch in her presentation here. So such attempts to intimidate her, however, seem to fall short. She refuses to recognize her owner as her master, and she in the ongoing narrative she has, she continues to address him only as the enemy of God. And she disdains the barley bread she is given to eat, even when subjected to escalating violence, an excrement-covered broom is thrust into her face, and a blow to her stomach produces a miscarriage, she refuses submission. The confrontation and deflection of male violence is further supplemented by women's activities 
in the support of their menfolk then who fall victim to piracy. Maria stood by her captain husband until his death, and Fatna is negotiating not just her own uh, ransom, but that of her husband as well. Uh, other women who were not captives themselves worked hard on behalf of captured male relatives. For example, the English king, Charles II's cousin, uh, Moreau, Earl of Inchiquin, uh, the cousin and his son were captured and imprisoned in Algiers in 1660. As well-connected noblemen, they were considered high-value captives, and their ransom was set at 5,000 uh, pounds a head. No, I think 5,000 pounds actually for the two. Uh, but it was a king's ransom. Uh, it was the Earl's wife, Countess Elizabeth, who swung into action. She first petitioned the king, she's back in England, but she first petitioned the king, pleading that her husband and son had for more than six months been, and I quote, in miserable captivity under the hands of those barbarous infidels and thus have undergone the sad effects of slavery and bondage. And she requested specifically that the king send his navy to demand their release. And failing that, and it would be failing that because he wasn't going to do that, um, failing that, that um, the king commission the English consul in Algiers to negotiate the ransom. Then she became increasingly concerned about the practicalities. And so in a second petition to the king, she reports that she has learned that the English consul in Algiers is not the best of negotiators, and that the ransom business would be better placed in the hands of an English merchant there, a man by the name of William Ryder. And then she also makes a very practical suggestion about how the king might raise the funds, uh, raise the money. In those days, you know, these were these kingdoms didn't have a lot of uh, disposable funds at their, uh, that they could draw on. So she says, um, you know, you could, she suggests that Charles uh, raise the money but from the London customs revenue. That would be a good source, she says, for, to get you the necessary funds. I'm sorry to report her interventions were not immediately successful. The, two years later, we learn that the Earl is still in captivity and uh, the ransom money has been sent supposedly 5,000 pounds, but only 3,700, I'm sorry, oh, oh, three, he's still short by 3,700, and there, a good portion of it had gone missing somewhere, and so he uh, doesn't, I'm not quite sure when he eventually gets freed, but it, ta it takes a little while longer. Um, so regardless of his fate, it's, it, there's little question that here that Elizabeth had acted with assertion and focus in her attempts to secure the king's intervention here. Um, Ottoman women might also uh, attempt to free relatives through the medium of petitions to the ruler for intervention on their behalf. In one such petition, a woman from Algiers um, joined her husband, joined with her husband to plead for help in liberating their son from the Spanish pirates holding him from ransom. As you can see here, after an invocation, um, after invocation, she said, this is the petition of your slave is the following. This slave's son, who is also your slave, was captured by Spanish pirates. I mean, this is a slave in the metaphorical sense, right? A slave of the ruler. Um, was captured by Spanish pirates from aboard an Algerian ship. He was taken to a Spanish city called Cartagena. The papers which came from Spain are attached to our peti petition. Uh, you know, we understand that one of the families similar case, asked you to send somebody to the French ambassador to rescue their son. Know that your slaves, the parents of this son, are at the moment destitute and cannot find a piece of bread to eat. Now their condition is exacerbated by the loss of their son. So the petition is that we beg you to look at the papers which came from Spain concerning our son and that you take our miserable situation into consideration, i.e. we cannot afford anything, and we beg you to contact the French ambassador. Right. So, um, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting about this petition is that it's signed by uh, the mother and the father, right? So both Fatma and Ismail display considerable savvy about the process necessary for the release of their son, requesting that the Sultan work um, through the French ambassador in Istanbul to arrange the ransom uh, for the son who's being held in, the, in a Spanish port. Their request draws on a deeply rooted Ottoman and Islamic tradition of petitioning the Sultan directly in his capacity 
as the protector of his people, while at the same time embracing the rather indirect and convoluted means afforded by state diplomacy. It's kind of a nice work through the French ambassador. So the prominent role of the mother draws our attention here. Did her voice, that of a female and a mother, carry special moral weight and was therefore for held to be effective? Um, certainly the role of women as mitigators, menders of male violence, may be being invoked here. We don't know the outcome, unfortunately, of this particular petition, but the fact that this and other such petitions were filed by parents together suggests a belief that this is a good approach, that this approach might work. Um, and women could also use the law to protect themselves from some of the negative outcomes of piracy in advance. Uh, we have, uh, for example, a uh, fatwa in which a woman by the name of Aisha bint Uthman bin Tayyab al Ansari, who was the wife of a corsair sailing out of uh, El Mahdiya in Morocco. Um, she basically goes to court in advance of the sailing to uh, have her husband agree to put her affairs in her hands with a, a legal maneuver which would allow her to effect a divorce should his absence be prolonged. And corsairing was a dangerous activity, and she was uh, obviously seeking to reduce the risk of finding herself without a husband and without a divorce, um, and in which case she would have had to, under Maliki law, uh, wait for four years before she could obtain a divorce and remarry. Um, so while there's a little question that women could be victims of male violence, of violence calculated to enforce submission in ways that are anything but subtle when it comes to the world of piracy and captivity at least, there's also a range of resistance, defiance, subversion, and mitigation on display here. Women were not by any means passive recipients of the violent acts inherent in piracy. So our final complication concerns the intersection of gender with other categories of difference when it comes to pirate violence. To a great extent, fair game in piracy was defined by difference, difference of religion, difference of nationality. In the early modern period, it also took on the cast of, it could, of religious war. Um, Walter Mignolo describes the early modern European global imaginary or emergence of understandings of the pattern and destiny of the world as a whole as a drama of the spread and ultimate triumph of Christianity. European captives were wont to give themselves starring roles in this drama. It was over their bodies and their souls that the conflict was raging. Our friend John Fox, for example, narrated his escape as a Christian triumph over Islam as proof that our God was more powerful than their God. Virtually all European captivity narratives share this trope. There is the inevitability of the pressure, physical or otherwise, to convert uh, to Islam which is mightily, although not always, successfully resisted. Captives who did embrace the new faith took particular pains to stress the extreme duress they had faced, no doubt as a method for defending themselves against the criticisms or even inquisitions they faced upon their return to Christendom, if in fact they had converted. On the North African side as well, corsairing was cast as a Muslim-Christian confrontation. Um, El Wancherisi's collection of North African and Andalusian legal opinions, uh, although assembled at the turn of the 16th century, was widely circulated and referenced throughout the early modern period we're discussing here. Um, these legal opinions assume that pirates, or thieves of the sea, as they call them, um, that prey on Muslim ships are all Christians. They're all Rum or Nasrani. The pirate encounter is invariably one between Christian aggressors and Muslim victims. The legal literature also pays due attention to the presence of Christian captives in Muslim lands, at least some of whom were presumably taken by corsairs. And the status of these captives has everything to do with their religious identity. All captives are Christian, um, and those who convert to Islam render their status problematic. In the legal opinions, it is Muslimness and Christianness that defines the legitimacy of capture, enslavement, and ransom, in keeping with the fact that the North African corsairs were being celebrated at home as warriors for the faith, um, engaged in seaborne jihad. So Mediterranean piracy did have this element 
of both of fanning and feeding off flames of religious difference. And if religion played a key role in patterning and regulating violence, so did nation. Uh, piracy was increasingly being regulated by legal norms and agreements forged by states. So ships, cargoes, persons were legitimate targets largely as a result of their uh, national or state associated identities. A regime of treaties and passports evolved to define and adjudicate the conflicts arising from pirate captures. Pirates had rules to follow, and they usually chose to abide by them in order to cloak their activities whenever possible in the stuff of legality. And uh, various people have noted the penchant of pirates to adhere to, to adhere to legal norms. Lauren Benton has a very nice piece on William Kidd, the English corsair who eventually ends up hanged, even though he did, in, by his own sights, play by the rules. Um, and uh, Molly Green's study of the tribu Tribunale of Malta, which was responsible for reviewing the legality of captures made by the Knights of Malta. Oh, I'm sorry. That's, uh, that's, I thought I had some Knights of Malta. I don't think I do. Um, her, her book about the Knights of Malta is, uh, I think, a very interesting one. It depicts the Knights as a somewhat restless but re respectful subjects of the court's authority. They are faced with a ban on the capture of Christian ships, cargo, persons. But the Maltese corsairs often try to argue that even though um, the Ottoman Greek captains uh, I mean, that, that the Ottoman Greek captains, yes, they were Christians. But uh, they were sailing Muslim ships and transporting Muslim cargo, so they, they should be fair game. Um, by the mid-18th century, it was the ship's passport that had become the chief measure of the legality of pirate operations. And that was regulated by treaty agreements, usually bilateral treaty agreements. And pirates had learned to parse these documents very carefully, just to give you an idea of kind of the rule of law in, in this whole picture. Uh, in 17. 49, for example, the Dey of Algiers had to apologize to the King of England for a seizure of uh, English ships by one of his corsairs under the pretense the corsair had boarded the ships and studied the passports and decided there were irregularities. Um, or there was another incident uh, very similar the same year, in fact, in which there was a British uh, King's packet commission um, and that was uh, captured by corsairs using the argument the ship was not carrying a pass and King's packets were not listed as exempt in the current treaty agreement, which the um, English f felt very much was a loophole that the Corsairs were exploiting. Um, so it was national identity and various instruments that defined it that alternately protected and made one vulnerable to pirate violence. But these lines of religion and nationality that I've just uh, alluded to were often crossed and clouded by the phenomenon of the renegade. And the, the renegades, the renegados, were those Europeans who had thrown in their lot with the North African corsairs and sailed as crew or even captains of North African corsairing vessels. And their numbers were actually very significant. So in the late 16th century, of the 35 captains of corsairing ships operating out of Algiers, tw uh, 22 of them can be identified as renegades. So well over half of them are actually captained by um, Europeans. Uh, one of the most notorious was the Englishman John Ward, who became commander of a Corsair fleet manned by both Ottomans and Englishmen at the turn of the 17th century. Uh, he enjoyed a very successful career as a Corsair captain, converted to Islam, eventually retired in Tunis as a wealthy man. His biography was dramatized during his lifetime, by the way, by um, uh, Robert Dayborn in the early modern English play, A Christian Turned Turk. Um, the, this fluidity of social and national identity that we see in the case of the renegades was being witnessed time and again in their careers and aboard their ships, um, and, 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 and aboard the ships that they sailed. Corsairing vessels recruited crews characterized by high levels of cosmopolitanism. In Algiers, we have evidence for the presence of Spanish, Albanian, Greek, Hungarian, French, Corsican, Italian, English, 
and Dutch individuals on board pirate vessels, as well as the Turks and Moriscos um, and Arabs that one might expect to find there. Malta looked the same, you know, although all Christian, but quite diverse. Sailors of French, Italian, Spanish, Dutch, German, and Dalmatian background participated in pirate cruises out of Malta. Well into the 18th century, we still find, we still can find aboard a British privateering vessel, a crew composed uh, of Greeks, ne uh, Neapolitans, Venetians, and Genoese. Um, and there were many, for our purposes, European women renegades as well, uh, those who converted and then married into Muslim households. In the 1630s in Algiers, one source estimates that there were some 1,200 European women married into local households of different ranks. Most had their start as captives and then had chosen or perhaps been coerced in some cases to convert and, and marry. There could be a very dramatic rise in social status as a result. One of the wives of the Algerian ruler was an English captive of humble background. And another English girl, the one we saw on the cover of that book uh, at the beginning, another English girl was married to the Moroccan Sultan in the late 17th century. She took the name Balkis and became a valuable court contact for redemption activities on the part of Europeans. Um, the renegades, although a product of piracy in one way or another, really undermined the categories of religion and nation that justified and legitimized pirate activity. So how did the violence informed and allowed by difference in religion and nation intersect with gendered violence? Uh, as the story of Mediterranean piracy moves towards its finale, we see a convergence of these ways to signal and, ass and assert power. Piracy continued to be a feature of the Mediterranean up into the 19th century, but it diminished greatly in importance as European conflict and competition for trade in the region decreased and British and French cooperated in suppressing piracy. The national interests of the European empires came to be better served by securing the trade routes and the seas they now dominated and relying on their new naval powers, not corsairs, to police this territory. By the late 18th century, piracy was a fading activity pursued primarily by the southern shores, regions that retained only a small and a continuously contracting piece of the Mediterranean trade routes and the markets that had been their lifeblood for centuries. So piracy was rendered, it was not entirely eliminated, but it was rendered a rogue op operation largely shorn of its former coherence and its trans-Mediterranean networks. Uh, as the Mediterranean became a European sea, piracy was recast as a savage practice, an emblem of the barbaric, which periodically provided the pretext for imperial adventures, including that of the French occupation of Algeria. And without widespread Mediterranean piracy and the connections it forged through these interlocking worlds of captives and renegades and all the business people who handled the ransoms and the goods, um, the lines of religion and nation and gender could be drawn more strictly and in ways that amplified the effect. So here is where we get a refitting of gendered violence as a badge of backwardness and depravity that was very much part of a new attack on this new attack on piracy. The earlier European renderings of North African corsairs, and this of course is uh, Geraldine, known by the Europeans as Barbarossa, um, and here we have a um, portrait of a corsair, I think it's called Corsair with a Bow, uh, by Pier Francesco Mola. Um, these are, I would say, respectful pictures, images of dignified masculinity. Um, by the 19th century, however, this kind of thing disappears, and it is more, the more familiar image is that of the the North African slave market with the image of the white female slave that haunts the artistic imagination of Europe in this orientalist rendition of Jerome. And, um, you know, among other things that we see introduced here, which are totally absent in the early period, is the strong racial theme. 
So it's the exercise of a depraved, gendered power by the other, who is by virtue of uncivilized religion and nation, and now race as well, that sets the tone for the new Mediterranean order that will be one of European control. Uh, gendered violence has now been placed in the service of colonial rhetoric. So in closing, I, I hope that Mediterranean piracy, or a little visit with Mediterranean piracy, has helped to focus our attention on the complexities of gendered violence, past and present. The pirates' violence served uh, not only to assert male dominance over women, but certainly to affirm masculinity in conflicts with other men. Women entered into this violence in a variety of ways, certainly as victims, but they might also collude with men in violent acts, as well as seek to deflect or mitigate the effects of the violence. And finally, we see gendered violence taking new and arguably more virulent forms as it intersects with evolving categories of difference with religion, with nation, uh, and with race. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So why don't you just entertain questions? questions? And yeah. I just would ask that when you state your question, that Professor Tucker will repeat it because she's being filmed. So just to speak clearly and we have some time for questions. Okay. Phoebe. Um, thank you so much for really just such a fascinating topic. Um, I'm, I'm, I was really interested in the captive narratives that you mm -hmm. alluded to. And I was curious about whether the violence that's represented um, as a consequence of piracy being captured through that, that sort of violence differs is, or is talked about in different ways than, say, had someone been captured through a caravan raid. Oh. On land, like mm. I, I guess I'm just curious about how violence was seen differently in the sea versus on land, and right. whether we have you know captive narratives on land that might provide that contrast and maybe pick up on some of the gender yeah. issues that you've been exploring. Is that is that something you've considered or? I haven't actually. I haven't, and so I haven't read the the captured on land uh, narrative. So. Um, uh, ex except in other people's work. Um, a, there are a couple of interesting recent, uh, well, Leslie Pierce actually is working on women captives, land captives now, so she's got this project going. I should co probably compare notes with her about, you know, whether or not there seems to be some kind of significant difference. Uh, I mean, the, the problem with the legal literature, because I work a lot with the legal literature, the problem with the legal literature is, for them, a captive is a captive. So they don't actually don't tell you how, the, whether the person got captured on land or sea. It's not a distinction that they find meaningful. I don't know if that is significant, how significant that is, but um, that is one of the problems. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I, I have a question, but I have, uh, I'm not sure if uh, it relates directly with the topic but, uh, about Jerome. Mr. Jerome, mm. I see that he has problem in understanding the mentality on the culture of the Arabs or the area. If this, oh yes, he definitely does. Yeah, <laughs> right, even yeah. if they're going to buy the woman, yeah. they will pay for you know price. Right, they right. Like her cover because they don't want anybody to right. see the you know the, the body right. of the woman. They're going right. So that's it's it's a part of the the problem that understanding. You know the the relationship between the the slave the, as a as a female and uh, the male, the owner. Right. Uh, because in Islam also it's acceptable. You know, it's like to marry and to have her as a legal wife and mm -hmm. to have mm -hmm. children. Yes, I mean, th th this is a painting that is completely fanciful. It really belongs to the Orientalist genre of painting. So it's a, it's a fantasy, you know. It's, it's, a, it's a fantasy and an anxiety and an othering, and it's doing a lot of different kinds of work here, right? But it's not a, it's not a depiction of any kind of reality. One would never it's, claim uh, that. Uh, this is uh, what creates, you know, problem from the other side, you know, it's like, you know, why, you know, in the, the, the area of the Middle East or around, you know, they are not fighting for the rights of women or women rights because the images, you know, that appear in the, the Western culture. Mm -hmm. So this affects negatively, you know, the mind of the conservative. Right. You know. Right, and it goes back to this period, I think, you know, I and mean, what's interesting to me is that if you go back a little farther in time, as I'm trying to argue, I mean, I'm not trying to um, 
argue for some kind of a idyllic past when everybody got along and understood each other and tolerated each other, but the, the sort of level of, um, you know, the virulence of the image really is a, is a product of a evolving 19th century imperial mentality. Yeah. Yeah, Will. Yeah. Okay. So the question is about ransoming and how widespread was or how active the empire was in the ransoming of its um, captives. I don't know the answer to the question, although I would love to know the answer to the question, but I did find a, these petitions that's in, in the Ottoman archives, and there, there are a, you know, a number of them. I can't remember how many I found, but I found a number, which suggests to me that people thought that the, the empire would um, respond. Now, I know we have a couple of famous cases in which the, uh, at, you know, at the level of interfacing with other states, the empire could be active, particularly if it thought that the other state had, the actions had contravened treaty agreements. So you do see, uh, there's one famous case in which the Ottomans actually send a delegation to the Dutch to complain about an Ottoman ship that's been captured and the cargo was um, uh, confiscated and sold and they want the car, you know, they want the, to be compensated and they actually send a physical delegation all the way to The Hague to um, present their case, to complain to the Dutch. Um, and it's actually a cute story because the Dutch, um, you know, the, the, the Dutch, whatever, council or whatever that rules uh, uh, Holland at the time, they basically are sending, sending missives to their, uh, uh, you know, their representative in Istanbul saying, try to get them not to come. You know, it's going to be too expensive to entertain them, you know. <laughs> we'll try to work this out. So, um, so they definitely did intervene sometimes. Uh, I think if it was a costly enough and if, I don't know, someone pulled the right strings probably, um, they could get the you know, intervention from the top. Um, and then I can only assume, because these petitions exist, that people thought they might, uh, they might be able to get them to act, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Thanks, I love, I love that talk. Um, I was wondering about the, the, some of the fictional representations of captivity. And I'm thinking of Robinson Crusoe, mm -hmm. and Cervantes, the tale of the captive, and also Mozart's in the story of Leo. And if you deal with those at all as a way of kind of like teasing out some of the, uh, how, you know, how, how it works in terms of kind of merchant trade in Robinson Crusoe and the rise of commercialism. Right, right. Um, and in Cervantes is very interesting because of the captive narrative. It's a Muslim woman who helped freeze him. And right. then he unveils her for this kind of Christian audience. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course he was a captive himself, yeah, so it's yeah. it's got a strong autobiographical yeah. dimension, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not sure about the woman. If that yeah, like I, I don't know. Accurate. Yeah, yeah. But Cerv this is a question about um, fictional narratives and the, the number of fictional narratives of captivity and whether I deal with them. Uh, I don't. <laughs> right. Um, uh, yeah. Um, but but I think it would be you know it'd be a, a nice uh, extension of the project to look at fictional. Uh, narratives as well. Well, yeah. I was thinking about when you're talking about the kind of role of masculinity, because in, in, in <coughs> Crusoe, he doesn't talk about the proposed roles of Crusoe. He doesn't talk about, like, there's no mention of women through the entire, except his child, really. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting, because he protests his, ca he's captured by Turks, and then he's um, taken to Algeri Algiers. And he spends his time, but he says, you know, they didn't treat me badly, but you know, anyone who's known liberty is just desperate for their liberty. So he right. escapes. Then his shipwreck is when he's transporting slaves from Africa to his plantation in Brazil. Hmm. And there's no comment again. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that the fictional, you know, these narratives could obviously inter introduce and flesh out a number of, of questions. Yeah, so it's a good, it's a good idea. Yes. Talk about fictional. I mean, there are operas, first by Mozart and then later mm -hmm. by Rossini, mm -hmm. where the women really come out on top every time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They are the, the true hero and the, So it must have been discussed even before or into this game, the game, 
this kind of thing. Right. Right. Right, right. Which would be a very, you know, it, it, again, it would be a very good use of, of fiction and other artistic productions to, to watch this. What I would think we will see is what you suggest is this change over time, this uh, from, um, you know, towards more and more of, of, of this kind of uh, gendered violence as, uh, you know, the depravity of the other, um, that that is going to uh, be introduced at a particular point in time, I'm guessing, and, and developed, right? But it would be a good way to trace it, I think. Uh, yes, Nada. Uh, thank you so much for your, your work. It's really interesting to see the parallels of like, this moment like with you know, the discussions happening right now. Um, but, uh, you, and you spoke about you know, how violence is being conducted men against men and how this is reaffirming like, the kind of the order of Know, men's relations, um, but I was wondering if you found any uh, accounts, I guess, of women and their relationships with each other, and if they're, you know, using violence or, um, you know, in working together in terms of uh, countering the, like acts against men, uh, acts from men. Like, have you found anything like that? Or um, I know it must be difficult. Yeah, I mean, nothing comes to mind off off the top of my head, although I, I, it was the uh, question of whether, I need to repeat the question. So the question was um, whether there had been in these narratives evidence of women working with other women to fend off violence or, uh, you know, deter it or mitigate it or whatever. Um, not, nothing comes to mind off the top of my head. Uh, a, a lot of the, the women narratives they have a lot of men in them, I would say, right? And a lot of the, when it comes to violence issues, it's a lot of dealing with male violence, either, you know, shoulder to shoulder or, you know, defending themselves or uh, deflecting it. Um, but but I, I, it doesn't mean it's not there. So I, I should probably go back and, and look and think about whether or not there are instances of um, women cooperating with other women uh, in, the, in their maneuvers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, I was wondering about the, um, the fate of women who would have been captured um, and who found, their ways, uh, who found their way into marriages in um, North Africa. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering through what mechanism would that have happened? Would they have been sold as slaves and then manumitted by their owners and married to them or married to them before they were manumitted? Um, do they command a, a great enough price that would be worth sort of selling them on a local slave market rather than demanding a ransom? Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering about the, also the dynamics of race in, in that sort of relationship, in the marital relationship, because we know from the work of Toledano and others who've worked on slavery in, uh, in the Ottoman world that um, that white sort of European background women often commanded greater prices who were more uh, highly sought after as wives, as concubines, than uh, local women. Uh, certainly more sought after than um, darker skinned women from the south and from Hejaz or so forth. So I was just wondering if you could comment mm -hmm. on that. So the, the question uh, has to do with, I just need to repeat the question, but it was a long question. So, but it has to do with the uh, women who marry and become parts, part of Muslim households um, and how, uh, how they get there, right? I mean, what, what is, what is the, the path they take from capture to living happily ever after or whatever is going on? Um, so we don't know much about it as far as I've been able to see. Uh, I mean, what is anecdotally, okay, and so what you see or what is said or what is reported is probably the, a typical path would be the following. So a woman would be captured um, and then she would be, um, you know, brought into a household. Um, but usually, although the men were tended to be held at least in North Africa in the in the often in the public banyos that they established to hold the men the women were much more likely not always but were more likely to be actually 
farmed out to individual households. So once in the household, of course, not everybody gets ransomed, and not only everybody gets ransomed quickly. I mean, we have, particularly if you're a poor person, we have stories of people staying there for decades sometimes before the ransom money comes through, um, if it ever does. Uh, that's a minority of people, but there are people like that. So someone could end up uh, staying in a household for an extended period of time. And then at some point in that period of time, at least the standard story seems to be the woman converts to Islam. You know, uh, we don't know what, you know, willingly, coerced, hard to tell, but the woman converts. And then sometime after, conversion doesn't automatically free her, but once she is converted, the tendency is to free her. So she converts, she is freed, and then um, she marries, right? And she marries, you know, into households at a, uh, of a variety of different um, backgrounds, you know. As you can see from the top, she could marry into the ruler's household down to a much more modest household. So I, th I think that's the, that seems to be the, the most common pattern for women who end up permanently living in these households. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Just following on that, you mentioned 1,200, I figured 1,200 in Algier, in Right. Is that, um, and that was when, in the 17th? 17th century, yeah. Do we have any figures for the rest of North Africa at all? Or, and, and um, off the top of my head, I don't know of any for the rest of North Africa. You know, what, when, you, when you get a figure like that, it, also it's a figure that someone has estimated, some observer has estimated how reliable a figure is that, it's hard to say. I believe this figure this was uh, from this uh, Catholic father who was there at the time and was ministering to people in the, in the uh, captive community, and that was his estimate. Um, I think we just have these estimates pretty randomly when someone makes one. I mean, it's, it's very interesting to think about the stories that that then gives on to. But I also, it's a long time ago, but I'd also be interested in the oral histories that that has spawned, if any. I right. Just, have, you, have you any sense of that? Um, there's a, uh, this, I mentioned uh, this, there's a new volume by this um, North African historian, uh, Khaled Bekawi, and it's a, it's a collection of um, accounts, and most of them actually are European accounts of kept of captivity, women's, European women's accounts of captivity. But he has a really fascinating little appendix in which he's found a few things from the North African side. And one of them, for example, is a popular song, you know, that he has come down through the ages, you know, and but which definitely refers to that, that period. Um, another is a, is a popular piece of poetry, you know. Actually, you'd be really interested in that, uh, yeah, um, which also um, talks about, uh, kind of glorifies corsairing, in fact, from kind of a more positive uh, point of view, right? I believe so, yeah, yeah. He, I mean, he's there, he is, uh, his career is there, yeah, right. Fantastic talk, and um, I, I actually wanted to ask something about sort of framing um, masculinity in history, mm -hmm. because, um, you know, from a gender studies perspective in the region, there's so much more work that's been done on sort of women in general, and I really like the fact that you're bringing back into this discussion the fact that this is about men, masculinity, homosociality, and sort of masculine violence against other men, just bringing men as men in a way back into the history of the region. And I, I, because I'm not an historian, I would love to hear your thoughts on sort of how frequently is this being done, a kind of masculinity's perspective, if you will, in Middle East history? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we're trying to do this now in the sort of contemporary period. In fact, mm -hmm. in Jane News, we published a special issue on Middle Eastern masculinity. I'm working my own work on it. And um, so just, you know, gender in terms of masculinity studies, I, I would love to hear what you think about it as an historian, where things are headed. But then mm -hmm. secondly, in terms of framing, um, in sort of contemporary masculinity studies, there's been one dominant trope, which is hegemonic masculinity. You know, that mm -hmm. men are in these relationships and this dualism, the hegemonic dominant males and the subordinated, marginalized, you know. And you can see how it might work into this sort of piracy narrative 
the ones who capture, the ones right, who right. Are get captured, right, yeah. you know, the hegemonic mm -hmm. pirates versus the, you know, the captives and so forth. But I, I actually am sort of tired of that um, dualism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of trying to write against that, that we need to think of different ways of talking about masculinity. But, um, you know, in terms of framing, um, frameworks that are useful, if there are any, could you just talk a little bit about masculinity in history from mm. our area studies perspective? I would love to hear what you think about it, because this seems to be such a, it's a story in part about masculinity and, you know, women of course mm -hmm. fit in, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, how, how common is this kind of work? Are people thinking of frameworks to describe, you know, how men act as men in history in the Middle East? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is about uh, masculinity in the Middle East and uh, in, in the field of history and if people are, are engaging with this issue and if so, how are they doing it? Um, it it's, this is going to be very impressionistic because I haven't looked systematically at, um, I mean, it's on, the, it's on the radar now. That's a big, that's a big step, right? So I think historians, Middle East historians are interested in issues of masculinity and they are beginning to address them. I mean, I think of a, a recent book by um, Wilson Jacob, Working Out Egypt, is an example of this. Yeah, right, right, very much. Um, and so you can see that that's uh, clearly a subject that people uh, appreciated and thought was, you know, worthy of publication and attention. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think of other examples. I'm yeah. having trouble. Um, because my impression is you know, yeah. that we've hardly even entered into this territory in sort of contemporary <coughs> ethnographic studies right. or political science studies. I mean, just really, it's a lacuna, I think, in the contemporary period. And I was wondering if right. that's your impression also. Also, yeah. yeah. I'm thinking of another guy. John Willis also has. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's published yet, but also, so there are a few people who are working on masculinity. I think it's often in the colonial context. That's my impression. I, I would say that that's where it seems to be, be, people seem to be focusing on. And maybe that does feed into the, that dualistic uh, sort of approach that you're talking about. Um, uh, and that may be a, a bit of a problem, actually. Uh, so I don't, I wouldn't say, at, to the best of my knowledge, we don't have a, um, an original or uh, framework for it, you know, or even a standard framework for it. There just isn't enough work out there to say what the standard framework might be, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So there's a, this, you know, one sort of edited volume, um, which is called Islamic Masculinities, which is trying to look mm -hmm. at Muslim men as men, but you know, it's not mostly historical, and it just seems like it's a subject that's sort of crying out for attention, right. including by gender scholars, but I guess then the question is, well, who's going to do the work? I mean, our field, as you can see, you know, I mean, there's so many women who work in sort of gender studies, and mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that if you know, women have to, you know, work only on women's issues, I mean, obviously not, but <coughs> I, I just think it's masculinity studies, you know, it's very important and interesting, and it hasn't really been, you're sort right. of confirming my impression, which is, there isn't that much work. Work, yeah. Right? I mean, to, not to the to the best of my knowledge, no, there isn't that much work. Although, you know, I, I had the experience of trying to of thinking about this this talk and sort of bumping into it. It was like, how do you talk about gendered violence um, in piracy <laughs> without taking men into account, right? And the fact that again, men, and and then I ran it. There are there is some interesting work that's been done um, in European history about male violence in the past, and um, the, the one um, piece of work I referred to by this Robert Shoemaker, um, very, in, very fascinating because what he does is he, and it, I guess it's known in um, English history is that there was this big fall off in public male violence. So, you know, you were on the streets of London in the early 17th century and you were a man Oh boy, watch out! You know, it was a dangerous place because someone, if you got insulted, you had to respond. You know, with violently, you had to respond with violence or agreeing to by agreeing to a duel or something. Just if someone says, it's kind of like that Shakespeare thing. Someone says, you know, you know, your 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 nose is off center or something, and then you have that. Then you have to defend your honor. So, in point of fact, anyways, he showed that homicides were off the map and they were almost all male-on-male -male public violence. And then what happens over time, by the time we get into the 18th century, uh, you know, along into the 18th century, this male-on-male -male public violence falls off. 
violence becomes not good news in a sense. Violence becomes more male on female and more domestic space, you know? So what does that tell you? You know, it's, it's, so I think those, these are the kinds of questions we have to ask. You know, what, how does violence change in the context of changing um, social mores of, um, you know, new forms of domesticity of, um, you know, new kinds of state intervention in violence. I think there are a lot of different questions one might ask to kind of historicize the discussion. Yeah, but I think it's really important that you pointed out, you made such a strong point here that much of the violence historically is male-on-male -male violence. There's a sort of assumption, I think, that we have this men doing something violent to women, but in fact, it's military, it's, mm -hmm. you know, other mm -hmm. types of outlaw masculinity and violence, you know, that men are killing each other and, you know, doing violent things to each other. Right. Which, you know, often, I mean, men are often the victims of violence. Even today, mm -hmm. regionally, it's men often who are the ones who are getting tortured. And, you know, yeah, so we yeah. can't forget that, that, right. that men, you know, are often the ones in that position right. to be violated in one way or another. Right. You know, as I've been reading about violence, I mean, I've been reading some of the more contemporary disciplines, you know, the psychologists and so forth who deal with this. But, you know, they, I, they were, I looked at one very interesting large study they had done about talking with people about violence. Uh, this is individual public violence, kind of. And um, the, ki the kinds of fears and anxieties that people expressed were totally out of kilter with the realities of violence on the ground. So it, women were much more afraid of violence, even though in this urban community, men were much, much more likely to be the victims of violence. So women were much more afraid of strange men, whereas they were much more likely to be victims of men they knew. I mean, there were things like that. It was just our, often our perceptions are totally out of kilter with uh, the actual uh, structure of violence that we are ourselves embedded in. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask the question about the intersection of the sort of economy of piracy in the Mediterranean on one hand and political power on the other. And you basically located a, a potential space for this within the marriage between sort of elites on the North African coast and women who had been, um, who were, you know, potential for ransom but wind up married. And you mentioned that they were a diplomatic chat mm -hmm. chat for mm -hmm. um, future, uh, basically, kidnappees. But I'm wondering if this translated into um, more, like more political dialogue between, you know, diplomatic channels in one country and the Sultan on the other, and whether it can even contribute to an upsurge in piracy because there is this channel and you can actually filter people through a system more quickly if you have uh, a trusted mm -hmm. negotiator um, right. sort of on the ground. Right. So there's, there's sort of a perverse incentive system there. Right. So this is a question about women, captured women who end up being married into elites uh, in North Africa and whether their very presence uh, kind of oils the machinery of uh, piracy and ransoming and so forth. Um, I guess my first response would be, I'm not sure the machinery needed much oiling, you know, it, it seemed to be functioning pretty well. The ransoming was a big business. There were a lot of intermediaries involved, particularly, for example, Ottoman Christians played a big role in uh, the ransom business. Um, European consuls were very much involved too. You know, in, those, in, those, in the 17th century, European consuls are generally not uh, paid salaries, and so therefore they make their money by various, they, they're traders, and they also do things for fees, and this was one of the things they did, was they, um, you know, were uh, ransom negotiators. Uh, so they, they were a lot of systems in place. So, so I'm not sure how important this would have been as a, as a way of really uh, keeping the whole ransoming business going. I think it was going just fine. You know, I, I don't think it was a, you know, I don't think it was a problem. I mean, having said that, you find people referring to the fact that these women, that sometimes like this Belkis, the fact that she's there, the fact that she has the ear of the Sultan, that this is a good thing for us and we're able to get our business done. You know, she's able to intercede with us and just expedite our ransoming activities and so forth. So I wouldn't discount it altogether. I just don't know quite how much weight one would give it, um, given that, as I said, ransoming was seemed to be going quite smoothly. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. 
Okay. Yes. There's a letter in the Turkish and the letters where it's the Lady Mary goes to visit one of the harems, and it's one of the women in the harems, and one of the elite Ottoman women. And she tells about being captured by, I think she's Spanish, she's captured. And then her family puts up a ransom. And But the guy who's captured her, he's in love with her. No. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'll free you, I'll do whatever you want, I'll give you back, you don't have to exchange any money. She says, No, I don't want to be given back <laughs> yeah. because then I'm going to have to fear the kind of, you know, uh, it could, could, the, I think she, you know, she wasn't, there was sexual, there was kind of a sexual relationship between them. Mm -hmm. And so she didn't want to be given back. So she stays with him and she says, Tells Lady Mary how happy she was and that she, yeah. she didn't. So she wanted to stay and convert to Islam rather than go back. Go back, yeah. yeah. But I couldn't so, find any like historical record of that. Moment. Of that, yeah. Have you, do you come across? The, um, I haven't come across that story. This is about a, a story that Lady Mary Wortley Montague tells in her letters of meeting a woman in the uh, Ottoman Sultan's harem who was um, a captive and had voluntarily stayed. Right, had had basically rejected her ransom money from her family and so forth. And um, I mean, I think we, what we do know is that uh, people who go, who are captives for a period and then go back, um, you know, they face certain challenges upon their return. Um, one of them being if, if they have converted or if it's thought they have converted to Islam, that's a big issue, particularly in the Spanish case where they have this very active inquisition uh, still in operation in the period, so um, that was not pleasant for people and could end badly. Um, so yeah, that she was. She was think it was like the questions around her, her like you know, sex that she was going to be then just like put away in a, a, a nunnery. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. Right. <laughs> I think this would be better. Yes, <laughs> yes. I and I'm sure she that was, yeah. Very handsome and <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> right, right. She's fine with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, take courage from Teresa's question and ask you if you come across any information about another such tale. Mm. Years ago, I read just for the fun of it a book it's called, I think it was The Wilder Swords of Love. Uh, mm. Four yeah. <laughs> Four women and one of them. We all know that book. M.A. who ends up in the Sultan's harem and rises right. up and I think becomes Mahmoud the second mother, according to that tale. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She's Josephine's cousin. And yeah. Is there any historical truth to anything in that story? Uh, <laughs> you know, presented as like four biographies of extraordinary yes, exactly. women. Women, right, right. The wildest. The question was the wildest shores of love. What's the historical, uh, you know, foundation for it? I actually don't know. Yeah. Ta, uh, you know, right. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't know. I mean, but these are, as I, you know, these are, you, you can think of cases like it, right? Yeah, you can think of cases uh, like it. Part two is not a question, it's a comment. I don't think you've read The White Castle by Orhan Hamok. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, and that mm -hmm. seems to fit in because it also discusses Eastern, Western masculinity, switching identities, mm -hmm. piracy. Yeah. What yeah. is it to be a man here, to be a man there? There, yeah. Oh, that's a good suggestion, yeah. Also, I just had to throw this in. Mm -hmm. There's a, a Harlequin series called the Desert Romance series. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about women captives of you know right. Arab men who capture them, and then uh -huh. they end up falling in love usually with the, the captor. You know, right? Very similar to the story. But yeah. It's, yeah. It's this genre, you know. Oh, it's, it's been yeah. Really it's the whole the whole genre of uh, you know captive sex, you know, yeah, yeah. Sex, captive yeah. sex genre. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned quickly in the beginning, I mean, the whole, I, I at one point was interested in Victorian pornography, and, uh, and this, is a, this is a standard storyline. Uh, that was one of their favorite storylines. They have two, actually, that I, could, that I remember off the top of my head. One has to do with servants, right? But, but the other has to do with, um, you know, with kind of oversect servant, women servants who are, get involved with these men. But the other has to do with, you know, virginal English females who go on sea voyages and end up being 
uh, captured by pirates and being in harems and then that all takes up like three pages and then <laughs> and then the story really begins right <laughs> right but um, but this, this was underground pornography uh, it was not publicly distributed but it was underground pornography and that was the, the big advantage of being a graduate student at Harvard was they had uh, in Widener Library what they called the X cage which had all the <laughs> pornography in it. I don't know if by now, by today, it's moved into the regular collection, but um, they had a fantastic collection of Victorian pornography in the, in the X cage in the stacks. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think our time is up, but we thank you so very much for the time. Thank you.